When I was a kid, back in the 1980s, uh, I was uh, used to like to come home uh, after school and uh, turn on the TV and watch all the cool cartoons that were in the 1980s. I tell you what, there were some cool cartoons in the 1980s. But one of them I especially liked was one called He-Man and the Masters of the Universe. Anybody remember that uh, particular cartoon? A few of you kind of grin and, and kind of remember that uh, kind of silly little show. It was a show about a, uh, a young prince. His name was Adam. And he had this cat named Cringer. And they were both not very powerful or intimidating whatsoever. Imagine, matter of fact, old Prince Adam, he wore him a nice little pink shirt. And his cat was always over here in the corner. His name was Cringer. He was scared to death. He was a scaredy cat. And um, if that's all that was about, I guess as a little kid, that'd be kind of forgettable and you'd turn the channel. But the action for the show came about for us kids when Adam would bring out his sword that was given to him by some mighty power somewhere else. And he would pull that sword out, he'd raise it above his head, and everything would change all around him. Lightning shone around him. And all of a sudden, his pet cat and he would be transformed into He-Man and Battle Cat. And, uh, and there they were. And, and he would say as he lifted up that sword up, he said, I have the power. Some of y'all might remember that from your youth. I don't know. Um, <laughs> or maybe your children's youth. I don't know, one or the other. Now, now, all of that, of course, is fantasy fiction. But it reminds me of a problem that we sometimes have in our Christian life. We don't believe we have the power. We don't believe we have the power. We walk around in our lives like the Cringer and the Adam instead of the He-Man and the Battle Cat. We're walking around like we have no power. There isn't a real one to call out to who will give us strength that we need to overcome very real spiritual battles that are going on around us daily and we just don't ever raise up the sword and say, Lord, I have the power from You, from You on high. We forget that. We don't believe the power is available to us and some of us need to pull out our sword of prayer and receive that power from on high. Today, today we're going to look at a man of war who came to Jesus and he believed Jesus could do what he knew he could do by faith. And some of us need to start being comfortable uh, about asking God to do what we know he can do through faith and open our eyes to who this God is to whom we serve. Now, uh, why? Why do, we let, why do we let ourselves forget that we have the power of God? Why do we forget that? I mean, you'd think if you had some kind of power like that, you wouldn't forget it. We also have an enemy. We also have an enemy, part of it's ourselves, and we forget. We forget. We don't see things as they really were. And this same problem was actually a problem that the early church had as well. Uh, we're going to start today in Ephesians 1, 15 through 19, but then we're going to go over to Matthew chapter 8. Therefore... I also, this is Paul in his letter to Ephesus, he's reminding the church of, of the power that was given him to Christ. He says, Therefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. Now what is Paul praying for? Let's see what it says. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of Him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of His calling. What are the riches of the glory of His inheritance in the saints? And what is the exceeding greatness of His power toward us who believe? According to the working of His mighty power. Now that's the work of God's mighty power, right? And he says that exceeding greatness of His power is toward us, right? Who believe. So we have the power. Do you pray with kingdom authority? Now, when you go asking God for something, are you claiming the promises that He's already stated in His Word about you and for you as a believer? Do you know what the promises that God has given to you as a believer? 
In this passage here, Paul wanted the Ephesian believers to see the hope of their calling in Christ, uh, meaning those who were believers, and the riches. Did you hear that word? The riches of the glory of His inheritance in the saints. The exceeding greatness of His power toward us. He's saying that we have the power in Christ. Make sure not to drop off that point, though, in Christ. Right? Don't think, I've got the power. I've got the power in Christ, right? Some people think that they've got the power. Oh, no, you don't. We have nothing without the Lord. Our authority in Christ (coughs) has been described as a kingdom authority. Uh, Pastor Tony Evans, he describes it this way. He says that it may be defined as the divinely authorized right and responsibility delegated to believers to act on God's behalf in spiritually ruling over His creation under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Now, let me repeat that again. So we get it real clear, all right? He says kingdom authority is the divinely authorized right and responsibility that we have that's been delegated to believers to act on God's behalf and spiritually ruling over His creation under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Now what does that mean in relation to this? Paul prays that the believers in Ephesus will comprehend and apprehend what they believe. Do you comprehend and apprehend what you have in Jesus Christ? Or do you think I just got a, a ticket to go to church every Sunday for the rest of my life and, uh, and I got to get out of hell free card? I mean, is that what you think? No, you don't. You've got great and mighty power, great and mighty riches in Christ Jesus. And he's praying that we who believe in Jesus start seeing things as they really are and not as we sometimes think we are. Sometimes we get depressed. We get down. Everything's coming on around us and we think, oh, I can't, I can't, nothing's ever going to get any better. You know who tells you that? The enemy of your soul. Nothing's going to get any better. Nobody's ever going to hear the word of Christ. Nobody's ever going to get excited about Jesus anymore. Everything's going downhill, right? Is that what runs through your mind a lot of the time? It can. It can. We all have it go through our minds sometimes. We all get downhearted. And he's praying that those who believe in Jesus start seeing these things that really are. He wants God to make it clear to us that the power we have in having the ear of the creator of the universe. Do you know you can get a hold of God? And if it's in his will, he'll take care of the situation. And you can find out what his will is by looking into his word. Do you realize the power? Now, Now, this doesn't... This doesn't mean that we start naming and claiming a new sports car or a new spouse or some other selfish, greedy nonsense from the old days we have while living in the world. That's not what that means. It means that you start going to the one who has the authority as a child of His and you know that He made certain promises and God told you this so you can go to Him in His will and in faith ask Him to accomplish what He said. And you know what? He accomplishes it, doesn't He? But you've got to believe. Some of us never, never ever raise our hand and say, Lord, I need the power. <laughs> I need the power, all right? The soldier, the soldier I mentioned earlier, this man was a man who wasn't a Jew, so he wasn't a God's people back during that time. He lived in Capernaum for some time, but he knew enough about Jesus, this Jesus who had showed up on the scene, that he knew enough that he knew that this one had the authority to help him. Now, when Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him pleading with him, saying, Lord, my servant is lying at home paralyzed, dreadfully tormented. And Jesus said to him, I will come and heal him. The centurion answered and said, Lord, I'm not worthy that you should come under my roof, but only speak a word and my servant will be healed, for I also am a man under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to this one, go. And he goes, and to another come, and he comes, and to my servant, do this, and he does it. Now, that's the short version of the story. You don't have to go here right now. But over in Luke chapter 7, we get what Paul Harvey used to call the rest of the story. He adds on the the, the window dressing to everything that happened here. And there, in Luke 7... It tells us a little bit more to the story. It says a certain centurion servant who was dear to him was sick and ready to die. So when he heard about Jesus, he sent elders of the Jews. See, he sent somebody 
uh, to him, pleading with him to come and heal his servant. And when they came to Jesus, they begged him earnestly, saying that the one for whom he should do this was deserving, for he loves our nation and, and has built us a synagogue. Then it says Jesus went with him, and when he was already not far from the house, the centurion sent friends to him and saying to him, Lord, do not trouble yourself, for I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof. So he repeats here what was said in Matthew. So this man actually didn't even go up to Jesus, but sent ambassadors to Jesus, which would have been considered by Matthew here to be a him in just a shorter way of telling the story. Now, now, now that might bother you. That these two stories seem like there's some kind of confliction going on there. But there's no need in that. Neither is wrong. It's just two different gospel writers sharing their perspective on the events that actually happened. And this is what makes the Bible so trustworthy. Because you can ask any detective on the scene. I've asked detectives on the scene uh, about if, if, if someone, if you go up to a scene and everyone explains to you exact wording, the very exact same thing about what happened, what they saw occur, you know what that's a great sign of? They're lying. They've, they've gone over to the side and they've worked out all their, what they're going to say and they go over here. But here we have in Luke and in Matthew, they're both giving the, the story but they've got a little bit more that they're showing from each one because we all see things just a little bit different. And that's what makes the Bible so true Amen. in that. Now, I just want to get that out of the way before we go any farther so we know a little bit more about this man. Some things I want us to pick out about this man today. First of all, I want you to recognize he is a Gentile. He's not a God's people during this time, but it seems like he's a believer. He is a centurion. He has a hundred men in Rome's army. Underneath him. He's a high-ranking soldier. Unlike most soldiers of the time, though, he had a heart. And that's very unusual. This man is concerned about a slave. And he has actually built these Jews a synagogue to go worship in. He ain't your normal Roman soldier. Okay? And to give you an idea of the attitude towards slaves back during that time, the Greek philosopher Aristotle, he said this. He said, a slave is a living tool just as a tool is an inanimate slave. Give you the idea of what most in Rome were thinking about a slave, right? He's just not even a person. A Roman law expert Gaius, he wrote that it was universally accepted that the master possessed the power of life and death over his slave. If he wanted to have him killed, he'd just have him killed. Another Roman writer, Varro, he maintained that the only difference between a slave, a beast, and a cart was that the slave talked. So you can see what people thought of slaves back then. Now in, in relation here to these Jews, that they had come in, they'd taken over their land. Uh, the Romans didn't worship the Jews' God and didn't desire to. But this man, he seems to worship him. Not by what he says. We don't hear the Christian Roman centurion. We don't hear the Jewish Roman centurion. We don't hear the one who converted over. We don't hear any of those things in either text. But what we hear is this man's actions. Okay? His actions. He wasn't raised with God, the true God, as his God. But it seems he must have worshipped him because of the actions that had occurred in his life. The Roman gods were a bunch of bullies and haters. But the true God, the true God, he's love. And he's compassion. We don't, we don't have the man in this story saying he was a follower of God, but he's sure acting like it. Can I tell you something? There are a lot of folks out here today who they claim the name, but they don't walk the walk. Amen. They claim the name of Jesus, but they don't look like Jesus. And you can't really claim the name of Jesus and not look like Him too, okay? Because He's going to change you. You're going to have compassion for that person that everybody else says is nothing but a tool. And so this man shows who he is by what he does for faith, my friend. To truly be faith, it involves acting like God is telling the truth. That's why the Bible calls it walking by faith and not talking by faith. It's not a feeling like God is telling the truth. You hear me? Some of y'all may feel like God is telling the truth, but you ain't willing to step out on it, okay? You ain't willing to treat that guy nice that you, nobody else is treating nice. You're not willing to, to go out and put a little extra effort in to make sure God's being worshipped, right? 
You, you want to feel like it. I'll feel that way, but there's nothing coming out of you. Some of you, some of you may, may have a, a faith here that says, says God is telling the truth. I believe that God's telling the truth. And you might say that right here in church, right? But does your action show it? Do we have faith? Do we have faith? Real faith is married to your feet. It's married to your feet and your hands. Some businesses, in a desire to save money, I see them do this where I work at, they install motion detector lighting in certain rooms, right? You ever seen that? You all seen that before? That means that the lights come on only when there's motion detected within the room. If there's no motion, then there's no light. And this way, the lights go off, and, uh, and the, when the people walk out and they don't turn the lights off, they go off anyway, right? And thus, money is saved, right? No motion, no light. Can I tell you, God works that way too. God works that way too. God will give you the power and the light when you need it, but He'll wait and He detects the motion on your part. Amen. He'll wait to see you do something. Step out in faith to take over and do what He's told you to do. If there's no movement in faith, there's not going to be any power in your life. All right? No power to accomplish what He wants you to do. You've got to step out. Step out. This man... He knew that to gain access to the help he would need, he would need to have enough faith to step out and ask, right? Whether it was from afar, you know, we do that in prayer, don't we? We ask from afar, right? Jesus isn't here personally when we ask. We're praying to him, just like this man is kind of doing by sending these people on to do what he's asked to do. And some may have had faith when they went to the altar years ago for salvation and haven't had faith since to ask God for anything or to step out for anything ever since. Why? Why? You've got to step out for God, for Him to turn the lights on for you, don't you? You've got to step out. Now, now, another thing about this man, notice that Jesus answers when we ask. He's going to answer, Okay. There's going to be an answer. The centurion asked Jesus and told him his problem. And what did Jesus do? He said he'll come and heal his servant. Well, that's pretty simple and clear and easy, wasn't it? But he had to ask. Sometimes we get afraid to ask, don't we? We get afraid to step up and say anything or do anything. Why don't we imagine that God isn't going to answer us? His answer is either going to be three things, okay? It'll either be yes, it'll either be no, or it'll be wait. That's always his answer. Always his answer. And his answer is always the best answer, and he always does give an answer, okay? But let me tell you something. If you never ask the question, how do you know if you'll ever get it? The question's never asked. When I was in school, the teacher, they'd tell us that there was no stupid questions. Remember hearing that? No stupid questions? Well, why do they say that? Because every question that you asked gains you something, doesn't it? You gain a little bit more knowledge about why this is or why this ain't, right? But if you sit back there and you don't ever step out, you're never going to grow. You're never going to grow anywhere. You're never going to move into anything if you never step out and do anything or ask anything. If you aren't willing to ask Jesus, why would He give you an answer or any help if you're not willing to ask? The Bible says that people do not have because they do not ask. When was the last time you asked? You do not have because you do not ask. And this guy, he knew who to ask, didn't he? <laughs> he knew who to ask. And this man, this man, he understood authority. Isn't that clear? Isn't that clear? From what we learn in Luke with the rest of the story, Jesus was on his way to this man's house when he sent other friends to let Jesus know he wasn't worthy to have him in his house. He, he, he goes on, he commands the men from afar. Uh, and he says, I command men from afar in a war and they do what I say. He knew Jesus could say just a word to and his servant would be healed. Jesus doesn't physically have to come down to this altar when you bow down to pray, does he? I, I, I've never seen anybody when they come down to the altar to pray and, and Jesus just appear there. That'd be awesome. Uh, that wouldn't be awesome? If you just saw Jesus there. I've never had, seen that happen, but what I have seen happen is them get a hold of God. Ain't you? 
I've seen them get a hold of God, ain't you? Amen. I've seen that because I saw God answer in ways after they got up from off that altar. But he, can He say a word from heaven and heal the issue in your life even though He doesn't physically appear? Absolutely He can, right? Because He has the authority. Amen. Now here's the question. Here's the question. Do you, as followers of Jesus Christ, really believe that He can fix the issue when you call out to Him? Do you really believe that? The question, the question says a lot about our faith and the answer uh, here uh, to him in this centurion's case. It's one of the times we ever heard that Jesus said, wow. <laughs> Jesus says, wow. Think about it. Wouldn't you like to be the one on, on, the, on the books that had Jesus to say, wow? It says here that he marveled. Look here. At verse 10 with me. This is exciting, folks. Verse 10. When Jesus heard it, he marveled and said to those who followed, Assuredly, I say to you, I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel. And I say to you that many will come from the east and the west and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the sons of the kingdom, the Israelites, the Jews, will be cast out into outer darkness. They'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then Jesus said to the centurion, Go your way, and as have you have believed, so let it be done for you. And his servant was healed from that same hour. There you're seeing kingdom authority in Jesus Christ, okay? A believer who is living under God's authority can also believe, receive his blessings when he asks, right? Jesus said here that nobody among God's people, the Jews, was expressing a faith like this in his time. Nobody was, even the disciples, they're Jews, okay? And this centurion was expressing a greater faith than the disciples who he had just given the Sermon on the Mount to, okay? This centurion was doing that and he marveled at it. He was like, wow, this Gentile gets it. Sometimes I think the Lord gets all excited when there's somebody in the church and all of a sudden they get it. They get it, right? The lights come on and you see the little uh, light bulb go on top of their head and they realize I need to step out and do what God told me to do. And then they go do it. And then God says, whoo, right? The motion light's been on, let's go, all right? But it just took you to just get in your mind. God's going to do it. And then step out. Step out. He's impressed with him. He's impressed with him. Reminds me of what the Lord's going to say there when you enter into heaven. It says, the words we all want to hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Faithful. Good and faithful servant. I want to have a faith like that, don't you? Amen. I want to have a faith like that. A marvelous faith. What does a marvelous faith do? A marvelous faith assures you in your salvation. You're certain of it, okay? Jesus said those many Jews who didn't have faith were not going to meet their relatives, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, over in heaven because they didn't have faith in Him like this Gentile did that day. He's saying this Gentile is going to... He has saving faith. He's, got sa he's put all his faith in Him. So he has saving faith. A real saving faith will, will move just like Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob did, if you look at it. What did Abraham do when he's told to go out of his homeland? And, what, and God would show him, step out, Abraham. Go this way and I'm going to bring you to this land. What did he do? Did he not do it? No, he stepped out, didn't he? He stepped out and he went out. Isaac, his son, God told them to take him up to an altar and burn him as a sacrifice. And they believed that God was going to raise him from the dead. They didn't have all the Bible we had back then. All they heard was what they certain was God had spoken. And they went up there. And you know what Isaac did? It's, it's theorized that Isaac was a grown man during this time, okay? Isaac let his old man father wrap him up in rope and lay down on that altar and said, we're going to follow whatever the Lord said. Whew. Wow. That's some faith, isn't it? That's some faith. That's some faith. But he did it, didn't he? Amen. He did it. Jacob, thank, thank the Lord he ain't never gave me nothing like that, okay? He told me to do. Jacob told his family not to bury him in Egypt. 
But take him to the promised land and bury him. He made plans that this would occur, right? Jacob stepped out in faith. Now, he had a lot of rickety, rickety faith all throughout his life. But he did step out in faith there at the end. And prophesied from his staff is what the scripture says. If you've trusted, you who are sitting here today, and you who are listening online, if you've trusted that God will take you from your dead body when you die and take you to a whole other existence in heaven, why can't you trust Him that God will help you with what you need here today? Think about that. Doesn't it logically make sense that God can take care of the situation right now if He's going to take your soul out of your body when you die and take you on to glory? If He can do that, He can do anything, can He? I wish, I wish we had the childlike faith we had some of us have when we come, first come up to an altar and receive Jesus as our Savior. <laughs> I really do. What mighty things God would do. What marvelous faith we would have. See, a marvelous faith, the second thing about it, it sees God act. That servant was healed, right? God can heal your situation. Some of y'all are living in a situation where something is, is ripped open. It's unhealed. It's seeking up grand green. There's a lot of trouble in that situation. But if you'll trust God through it, God will take care of it. And if you'll ask in faith, Lord, I'm trusting you. Now the answer might be no right now. There might be something bigger that you can't, you can't see. But He'll give you an answer, okay? Amen. He'll give you an answer. Hebrews 11.1. 1. Hebrews 11.1. 1, it says this. It gives the definition of a marvelous faith. It says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. Now think about that. Do we use that type of language with faith and hope? We don't talk about substance. We don't talk about evidence when we talk about faith and hope, do we? But when we talk about the marvelous faith that, that you have in Jesus Christ that sees Him act in your situation, it is something that has substance. It's something in reality, isn't it? It isn't just something that isn't there. It's something that's here, right? It's evident. You can see it take place. And things, things we can't see like hope become things we can see in substance and evidence. Let's, let's believe God can take our faith according to His will and bring about what we ask. Jesus said to that man, <laughs> He said to that man on that day, Go your way and as you have believed, so let it be done for you. You want to see things happen here at church? You want to see things happen in your family? You want to see God react in the situation that you need Him to react within? You have to step forward and believe, right? So as you have believed, let it be done for you. We can have the power in Christ.